afternoon and evening, everyone. On behalf of the AgriLinks team, I'd like to welcome you to the October Ag Sector Council webinar titled, The Next Generation of Civil Society Engagement, Boldly Going Where No NGO Has Gone Before. We're excited to have a great lineup of speakers today to discuss the realities of engaging civil society in agricultural development projects. The monthly Ag Sector Council seminar series is a product of the USAID Bureau for Food Security and is implemented by the Knowledge Driven Agricultural Development Project. My name is Julie McCarty, and I'm a Knowledge Management Specialist with the USAID Bureau for Food Security. I'll be facilitating the webinar today, and so you'll see my name in the chat box and hear my voice during the Q&A session after the presentation. Uh, thank you to everyone so far who has introduced yourself in the chat box, and please continue to do so. It's always really fun to see that we've got a global audience for these webinars. Throughout the webinar, we encourage you to use the chat box to network, uh, to share links and resources, and to ask questions about the presentations at any time. And we'll pose those questions to our speakers in the, the last section of the webinar today after the presentations um, when we begin addressing Q&A. And we also have a few um, speakers on hand or, or experts on hand to help answer your questions directly in the chat box. Before we get started with the content, I'd like to quickly announce some exciting news on behalf of AgriLinks. We are upgrading the AgriLinks website in November. And so later uh, next month, you will see a new platform when you log on to agrilinks.org. We've listened to feedback from ag practitioners and professionals to really completely revamp the, the website for the better. And the new site will still have blogs, resources, and online trainings brought over from the current version of the site. But we'll also add some all new functionalities to help practitioners connect with each other and learn. The new discussion area that we're featuring, it will be the biggest change and one that we hope you'll quickly take advantage of. Practitioners can use the discussion page to ask questions, discuss challenges, and share ideas. And the site is also more accessible than ever. A mobile version and a low bandwidth option uh, mean that practitioners can easily ac access AgriLinks resources from the field. So for more information on this, please feel free to contact me or any member of the AgriLinks team um, using our emails or the agrilinks at agrilinks.org email address. All right. So today we are here to discuss the next generation of civil society engagement. And before we delve into that, uh, our presentation today, I also wanted to briefly call your attention to another AgriLinks event on civil society engagement held last Wednesday as a precursor to today's webinar. We held a one-hour online chat on the AgriLinks website featuring a panel of experts from Comonix, Catholic Relief Services, and Interaction. And participants asked questions and partook in a very rich discussion about engaging civil society in project design and implementation. So I encourage you to visit the link on this slide, and we'll also post this link in the chat box to view the full discussion. And just to call out three of the key good practices that emerged from that discussion last week, some of the key points. Um, number one is that definitions for civil society, just how we define it, vary widely depending on customary and legal standards in a given country or, or other factors. Um, but just setting these parameters on the definition does help prioritize needs and keeps us from slipping into equating giving grants to local NGOs as truly engaging with civil society on systemic changes. Second, capacity building is an important component of engaging civil society, particularly in terms of program design and implementation. It's important not to just pay lip service to building capacity, but to use assessment and other tools to understand the needs of a local organization and build from their strengths. Um, and then thirdly, overall engaging civil society needs to be purposeful and thoughtfully built into every phase of a project. So we just wanted to share those three takeaways from last week's online Ask Ag discussion. All right, so now let's turn to thinking about the next generation of civil society engagement uh, with Susan Polagruto, who will be giving an introduction. Susan is a senior democracy advisor for USAID's Bureau for Food Security. And that's her photo up there in the left of the screen. And she is uh, leading the effort to implement the Feed the Future Civil Society Action Plan to strengthen civil society engagement efforts. So I'm going to go ahead and pass the torch over to Susan to take over. So Susan, please unmute your microphone. 
Thank you, Julie, for that introduction. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. OK, great. Just checking. Um, thank you again, Julie, for the introduction. And welcome, everybody. And thank you so much for joining us this morning. As many of you may already know, Feed the Future has taken some very important steps in recent years to strengthen how we're engaging civil society. Through the USAID's Advisory Committee on Voluntary Foreign Aid, civil society organizations provided Feed the Future and BFS in particular with recommendations that ultimately provided the basis for the Feed the Future Civil Society Action Plan. That plan was launched in May of 2014, and it outlines some concrete actions that we will take with civil society to continue the fight against hunger and poverty. And some of the things are very, very specific for USAID and our staff, and that includes providing training. It includes um, providing guidance. It includes providing a best practices handbook that we're currently developing. And all of those activities that we're trying to do, we're ultimately trying to promote country ownership and the effective engagement and meaningful engagement of civil society actors in country. Um, as you already know, civil society partners often implement our programs, but they're doing so much more than that. They're providing us with valuable feedback and input on the priorities and how we design the programs that work. And they get the word out locally and globally on the importance of food security and nutrition e issues. So these groups that we're working with in country and even our US-based NGOs are really on the front lines of fighting hunger in their communities. And they're absolutely critical to strengthening food security in sustainable country-driven ways. So today's discussion and webinar, we're highlighting the importance of working with local actors to achieve the food, the future objectives, as well as how to partner with civil society and agriculture and food security programs and what that looks like. So today you're going to hear some useful approaches and tools for effective engagement, as well as some of the challenges and lessons learned. So with that said, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Winston. So Winston Buhella is responsible for planning and coordinating implementation of all institutional capacity strengthening interventions at relevant government institutions and civil society organizations at both the national and sub-national levels in Tanzania mainland and as well as in Zanzibar. He is a Tanzanian with professional background in corporate law engaged in development work specifically on capacity enhancement and service improvement for the poor for over 20 years. And through various training and continuous practice, he has amassed skills and experience in participatory management, human resources, organizational development, and he's provided a variety of workshops and seminars and trainings on these issues. So Winston, I will turn it over to you to tell us more about the program in Tanzania and how you're engaging civil society. So Winston, please take it away. Thank you very much. I hope you all can hear me. As the facilitator has just said, I'm Winston Bohela, working in um, Feed the Future program in Tanzania for nutrition. And I will be speaking from Tanzania, Dar es Salaam, and together with me, we have Janet Said, who is in Dar es Salaam with me, who will speak later on, and in Washington, we will have another speaker who will also comment later on and maybe participate in text messaging in the chat box. That's Dr. Nene. So in my presentation, I hope you I hope we all can can see. I will talk through five subtopics. I will introduce the program briefly, very briefly, and then I'll talk through the engagement of our program at national level in terms of the civil society at national level. And then I'll go through and how do we engage with the civil society at district and community level. And then I'll go on trying to talk what are the skills that are recommended for the next generation 
and then I'll finish with the, what are the actual tips for actionable tips for engaging civil society much more effectively. So as I said before, Wanzobora is um, a USAID-funded nutrition program under USAID Government Feed the Future Initiative, and its main focus in the, is on the reduction of maternal anemia and childhood stunting. And it emphasizes to do this by reduction 20%, and it does that by implementation of evidence-based nutrition SBCC interventions. The program is implemented by a consortium which has four organizations. It is being led by Africa, who is the lead organization, and together with that there is an organization, nutrition organization called CONSONAF. And CONSONAF is responsible for nutrition technical services. And then we have Manof, which is responsible for providing in the SBCC communication and programming, and Deloitte with main responsibilities in terms of institutional capacity strengthening. The program covers 33 districts with a population of more than 9 million and a half in eight regions of Tanzania, mainland, and Zanzibar. And uh, its main focus is actually based on the situation in Tanzania as being depicted by the slide which is being displayed right now because that's actually the situation in terms of the childhood stunting and maternal anemia in Tanzania and that's the justification of the project activities and interventions. So I will go directly to the CSO engagement and I'll start with at national level. At national level, the program engaged with an organization called COSMAT. COSMAT is engaged with the program at two fronts. First, it is engaged itself as part of the program consortium member. And at the same time, it is actually a beneficiary for institutional capacity strengthening. So the two sides of the, this CSO are actually meant to help each other in the sense that the, as consonant is implementing and is acting as a technical partner as a consortium member, it is at the same time enjoying and benefiting from the institutional capacity strengthening because the skills that are being gained actually have a chance to be implemented live in the program in terms of the activities that are being backstopped technically. So how did the program build consumer capacity? First of all, the program as part of its capacity strengthening to consumer there was an institutional and technical capacity assessment that was done, and then capacity gaps were established. And after that prioritization was done in terms of what are the key areas in terms of the SBCC technical aspect, the governance, and financial and grants management. And after those gaps were established and prioritized, Consonant was supported in improving and or developing governance, finance, and grant system. And as part of building capacity of this CSO on the side of technical, the CSO was provided an opportunity to lead the technical implementation of the nutrition SBCC intervention at all levels. And through this engagement, what has constant benefited, actually? And what have we achieved in this time? That through engaging the national CSO, constant, actually the program has managed to reach more than 1.7 million women and more than 1.6 children. And these were, have been reached by nutrition as business services. And because of making sure that the services are actually 
sustainable. At the end of the day, one of the means of the program was to make sure that the system was strengthened, the structures and the system that are providing these services. And by doing that, several people within the structures were trained and actually 33,500 people were reached in terms of either training or orientation, or at least in terms of awareness. And through the intervention and the engagement with COSNET, COSNET itself has benefited a lot in terms of being part of the consortium, because by being a member of the Monzo Bora Program Consortium, its profile have actually been boosted and the boost of the profile has radiated confidence in organizational competence to handle funds and program. And as a result of that, several donors have entrusted Consnet with funds and between 2014 and 2018, Consulate is going to be receiving and spending more than 10 million US dollars from three different donors that are not USAID. And actually, as part of a Benefit, Consnet has, is also right now using skills, tools, and experience that have been gained through the implementation of the Mwanzo Bora program in other donor-funded program apart from USAID. And of course, without saying that, because of getting more funds to implement other program, Consnet has expanded its staff base, and it has now managed to open sub-offices in the field in, in order to be able to effectively manage the sub-granted mandate and responsibilities. So that's the engagement at national level. So as I said before, we our engagement with CSO are, are at national level and at district and community level. So at community level, our engagement are uh, with the local, most of them regional or district-based CSO. And how did we procure and engage with the CSO? We did that by making sure that actually we award the existing and the operating CSO. And the awarding, the whole process was based on transparency and competitive process and that was done by making sure that the institution assessment is done and the CSO were marked based on the technical competence and the combination the combination of technical capacity, due diligence and reference of their capacity, their past performance actually was the basis for their selection. And over and above that, the experience in implementing and managing grants or program for Africa or other organizations, whether funded by USAID or other entities, also increased their competitiveness. And through this engagement, the program actually managed to provide 14, managed to grant out subgrants to 14 local CSOs and they are all given contract to implement evidence-based nutrition SBC interventions. And through this engagement, these local CSOs have managed to reach almost 3 million men and women in more than 2,300 villages in the 20 councils of the program area in the first four years. And if you look at the entire process of procurement and awarding, actually the process has exposed CSO to transparency, competition, quality, accountability, family delivery, and discipline. 
And after engaging with them, how did you build their capacity? Actually, the CSEO were oriented on the program content and working tools, and they were introduced and all linked to the government institutions and structured with the mandate to support program interventions. And they were also introduced to the community-based volunteer service providers and the government-based program service providers. And at the end of the day, they are also introduced to the final beneficiary of the program services. And over and above that, the CSO were um, we are supported and we are moderated to prepare and plan and budget for the implementation of the community program activities and administration costs. And they are mentored and awareness session we are done together with them to make sure that they oriented the local leaders at the village and hamlet levels and they oriented the community based volunteer service providers. And they were also coached and mentored to form community-based beneficiaries, peer support groups, in order to promote discussion around recommended nutrition behaviors. And after being given their first orientation and their first initial capacities and introduction to the necessary structures, they were given sub-grants, funds, and opportunity to manage, implement, and spend, and report on the funds that they have been given to them. And they were um, alongside, as part of the implementation of the program, they were coached and mentored to effectively coordinate and facilitate peer support groups behavior changing discussions using provided nutrition at specific kids. They are also coached and mentored to effectively facilitate pharmacy days and demonstration plots to improve availability and accessibility to diverse diets. In the whole process, how did we ensure that there is ownership, sense of belonging, and we enhance the sustainability of the program supported services? Actually, the sustainability was promoted through mentoring and coaching to position CSO to involve and work within and with the existing government system, institutions, and structures at subnational level. For instance, CSOs were linked and supported to work with the relevant technical personnel at district level and extension workers at ward and village levels. And CSO were linked also and supported to participate in government planned nutrition intervention at district and community levels. In other words, we encourage CSOs to make sure that their plan and budget are actually reflecting are in tandem with what is happening at local government level so that they can marry each other. And over and above that, CSO were encouraged and supported to be part of the nutrition coordination and decision-making bodies and structure at district, ward, and village levels. And CSO were coached and mentored to request information from and provide feedback to normal government database and reporting system. So all the reports that the CSO are providing to the program are actually the very reports that he can also be retrieved from the normal government reporting system. Comparatively, through working with the CSO, we have noted several improvements. And one of the improvements is, is in terms of quality and quantity of the service delivery through their regular monthly and quarter reports. And we also noted a comparatively improved performance in their level of interaction with and support to beneficiaries. And that was easily noted through the review reports, on-site mentoring, and during the support supervision visit. So after working with the CSOs at national and subnational level, 
what are the recommendations in terms of the next generation of CSO on the screens that are needed? So generally we can say we recommend skills around basic organization and management skills and we are referring to things that are related to a normal CSO in terms of the entity choice, what organization legal status that is proper for a CSO because that's very basic, and skills that are related to proper planning, meaning planning that can be implemented, budget, Decision making, meaning making negotiations in the course of their working, they really need these skills in terms of making sure that they really fit in the normal system they are operating in. Effective supportive supervision skills and things that are related to asset management. And they also need skills around procurement, grants and financial management because as they grow, they amass, they collect money and they receive funds from donors and they need skills to manage this better so that they can even get more or even manage better the one that they have. They also need skills on resource mobilizations, advocates, lobbying and strategic positioning. Sometimes knowing exactly what do they need to say and where do they need to be at what time. It's very important also for them to have skills on self-assessment, starting and managing income generating activities, especially because most of the CSO that we work with are CSO that do depend on donor money. So sometimes you get a feeling and actually they admit that if that donor cannot give that money anymore or if a certain program ends up they don't know exactly what uh, how are they going to operate their CSO next time around. So in terms of what are the tips for effective CSO engagement is that in order to make sure that you have a really effective CSO engagement, make sure you start and build partnership on existing strength and willpower to deliver. This is very important because you cannot start from a clean slate. It has to, to start from things that are needed to be done. And after that, you have to appreciate the existence of a systemic and administrative or operational capacity gaps and identify, because usually there are a lot of systemic, systemic and administrative gaps, so identify those that are relevant or critical gaps that you need to address in order to achieve or to implement what you need to do, and then address those, those on preference. And sometimes it's good also to mainstream the capacity strengthening initiative, program, activity plan, and budget to make sure that uh, actually theory and practice do come together at the same time because that's the best way for them to become much more stronger. And always make sure you integrate the planned action within the existing structures and system in order to promote a sense of belonging and a continuity. So that means to ensure there is sustainability in what is be that. Thank you. And in Tanzania, Swahili, Asante Sada. Great. Thank you so much, Winston, for that presentation. Um, our next speaker is Adam Keats. Adam is an agricultural economist with over 12 years' experience designing, managing, and monitoring market development initiatives in 18 countries across Asia and Africa. On the USDA Rural Business Sector's Business Services Development Project based in Vietnam, he facilitated entrepreneurial investments in the coconut and rice sectors. With ACDI VOCA, he designed an organizational assessment tool for USAID Food for Peace, and he later served as a regional director for Southeast Asia based in Laos. As the economic team leader for Conservation International based in Cambodia, Adam designed and managed several field projects 
at the complex nexus of market system development and ecosystem management, including the USAID New Partners in Value Chain Development Project and the Women's Fish Processing Project. Both um, That last one is a subcontract under USAID Harvest. Adam is now Fintrack's Knowledge uh, Manager, and he leads evidence-based learning across a global portfolio of smallholder market development programs. Adam, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay, thank you, Susan. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? I sure can. Okay, great. Um, okay, good morning, everyone. As Susan said, my name is Adam Keats. Uh, I'm the Agriculture Knowledge Manager uh, for FinTrack based in our home office here. Uh, and I was previously based in Cambodia uh, for several years, uh, where part of that time I spent on pro uh, producer group development uh, with Cambodia Harvest. Um, so I'm going to be talking about uh, how the project, uh, how the Cambodia Harvest project has been engaging civil society. And I will be specifically focusing on uh, a case study uh, of commercial horticulture producer groups. Okay, uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, uh, but this is just to give you an overview uh, of the project's objectives and activities. Um, first, uh, Harvest is the Helping Address Rural Vulnerabilities and Ecosystem Stability Program. Um, it's not only a, a very impressive acronym, uh, it's also a five and a half year uh, food security program under the US government's Feed the Future and Global Climate Change Initiatives. Uh, we have an agribusiness component uh, that focuses on horticulture, primarily uh, uh, fresh vegetables. Uh, we also look at, uh, we're also working in uh, the rice value chain as well as the, agricult uh, the aquaculture value chain. Uh, with aquaculture, uh, we're working both in pond and cage systems. Uh, we also have the capacity building and social inclusion component, uh, which ensures that we integrate gender, uh, youth, and nutrition sensitivities into everything that we do. Uh, we have uh, the natural resource management component, which focuses on climate change mitigation and adaptation, and the enabling environment component, uh, which focuses on engaging with our public sector counterparts, uh, both directly and through technical working groups uh, to influence policy reform around agriculture, food security, and uh, natural resource management. So as you can see, it's a large, uh, multifaceted project with many moving parts. Uh, the project is now in its, uh, coming into its final year of implementation, and the impacts that we're seeing in terms of uh, economic, environmental, and nutritional gains are, are really quite substantial. Um, so first, um, Susan gave a, a bit of a primer on this as we started, but just to provide a bit of a, a bigger picture view of what we're, what we're talking about when we talk about civil society, um, I do think that there's a wide perception out there uh, that civil society refers almost exclusively to NGOs and interest groups, um, particularly those engaging in uh, political advocacy. Um, and, and while those types of organizations are certainly a, a very important component uh, of the broader sector, um, I think it's important to draw attention uh, to the diverse nature of this sector, and, and, and which is why this is a really valuable discussion we're having today thanks to USAID. Uh, and AgriLinks. So some key words um, that I'd like to draw attention to from USAID's CSO Sustainability Index are uh, informal, uh, self-governing, uh, free choice. Um, as you'll see in the slides that follow, these are a few uh, characteristics uh, that, we'll, that we talk about specific to how we strengthen uh, horticulture producer groups uh, in Cambodia. Um, uh, first, I'd like to set the stage with a, a brief uh, discussion about the local context in Cambodia, uh, because in so many ways, context really does matter, uh, particularly in terms of how local realities influence uh, the design and implementation of activities uh, engaging with and supporting the civil society sector. Um, first, the enabling environment, uh, particularly the legal and regulatory framework under which the civil society sector operates uh, is important. Um, there has been progress uh, as well as challenges, but generally the civil society sector in Cambodia is less established, less mature than in other regions, uh, particularly in Latin America, for instance, uh, which in many ways does have a, a relatively vibrant um, civil society sector. 
Um, so the public sector uh, in Cambodia and, and more generally in uh, Southeast Asia does increasingly recognize the role of non-governmental actors. Uh, however, there continues to be um, what I call here a, a reluctant acceptance and at times a more active restraint of the civil society uh, sector through formal laws and regulations. Uh, and that's particularly acute in the political uh, and environmental space. Um, I think it's also important to recognize how history uh, influences the dynamics of the sector. Um, in Cambodia, the, the legacy of the Khmer Rouge um, continues to influence many informal norms uh, in terms of the way in which citizens interact, uh, cooperate, and, and compete. Um, generally, <clears throat> there's still a, a distrust uh, of those outside the nucleus family, um, and there continues to be skepticism of collective production activities, um, particularly the term, uh, quote, cooperative is often viewed with concern. Um, and in many ways, this extends uh, to Vietnam and Laos as well, where they had similar uh, recent histories of, of forced labor. Um, so what is clear from the CSO Sustainability Index definition um, is that uh, civil society encompasses a broad range of, of local organizations. Um, similarly, uh, Harvest, the Cambodia Harvest Program, is working across a very diverse uh, group of civil society uh, subtypes, we could call them. Um, this engagement ranges from our partnerships with local NGOs uh, who are project implementers. In these arrangements, we strengthen their technical capacity uh, to deliver services to farming communities. And the program benefits from uh, those local NGOs in terms of their grassroots knowledge and expertise uh, within communities. Um, our engagement also uh, spans the strengthening of community-based organizations uh, to manage common pool resources like fisheries, water, and forestry, um, uh, also including building self-help groups like women's savings groups, and of course to uh, more explicit production-oriented groups in aquaculture, rice, uh, non-timber for forest products, and uh, horticulture uh, that we'll discuss here in more detail. Um, so across 11 different subtypes of the civil society sector, we're working with and through nearly 450 CSOs. Um, but for this presentation, we're just going to drill down specifically on how we strengthen those commercial uh, horticulture groups and some lessons learned uh, from those experiences. OK, so um, let's get into uh, specifically how the project supports the development of, the, of those producer groups. Uh, what do they look like on the ground, and what do they do? Um, well, in terms of scope, uh, their function is simply the production and marketing of horticulture products. Um, so each of the members share this targeted commercial interest. Uh, in terms of the form, on average, each group has about 12 members. Uh, they're organized at the village level uh, with members in close geographic proximity to one another. Uh, this allows them to aggregate their harvests as well as to aggregate uh, their demand uh, for inputs. And this aggregation is what attracts buyers and suppliers uh, and effectively uh, reduces the transaction costs of doing business uh, with small farmers. Uh, in terms of leadership of the groups, um, there is limited hierarchy uh, with uh, only a president, vice president, and marketing representative elected by the rest of the members. And finally, um, just to give you a sense of the scale that the project has been working on, uh, we have organized 73 of these groups, uh, representing 870 farmers to date. And uh, group horticulture marketing to date has resulted in about Uh, 1.1, and that represents about uh, 3,500 metric tons of horticulture produce. Uh, and now, how do these groups operate? Um, it's important to point out, as we'll discuss a bit in the Lessons Learned slide, that not every group operates the same. They're flexible in terms of the activities that they choose to undertake and how they carry out their work. Uh, but generally, their activities are centered around uh, input market access, financial market access, and output market access. Um, for input market access, um, the project facilitates uh, field days with input providers to demonstrate their products, raise awareness, and uh, build loyalty among farmer group members. Um, for the most part, farmers in Cambodia already know their input providers, um, but these activities solidify those relationships. And so um, some groups may also pool their resources 
to bulk buy inputs like plastic covering, seedling trays, et cetera, uh, like we see in this picture here uh, of a group that did that um, to bring down their unit costs. Uh, for financial market access, there are some groups, again, not all, uh, who may enter into uh, borrowing agreements with uh, local uh, MFIs where the group guarantees a loan for one member and upon repayment the next member is afforded the opportunity to borrow. Um, given the, the shared risk involved in, in these types of arrangements, uh, it's natural to see why not all groups pursue this course. Um, however, when it does work, uh, it can be a very effective way for farmers with, with limited collateral to access uh, working capital loans. And uh, for output market access, the marketing representative <clears throat> of the group conveys to members uh, the target crops of local buyers and the market window for supplying it uh, at where, where uh, peak demand exists. Uh, <clears throat> also, the marketing representative may organize uh, physical logistics with the buyer to minimize crop losses. Um, this may include either the coordination of a central collection point uh, within the village uh, or uh, scheduling buyer pickups at individual fl uh, plots uh, around harvest times. Um, so with those functions in mind, um, it's important to consider what skills these farmer groups need to succeed. Uh, first and foremost, uh, they need to understand the market. Uh, they need to know uh, what those market windows are uh, and the quality specifications for their target crops and how to program their planting to meet those demands. Uh, and that's what we call calendarized production. Um, next, they need to know uh, how to apply good agricultural practices uh, and modern technologies so that they can meet those uh, expectations and those market specifications. Um, the gaps we teach, the gaps of uh, good agricultural practices we teach include things such as uh, land preparation, including um, raised beds, uh, also seedling transplantation, uh, integrated uh, pest management, uh, of course, which is inclusive of crop rotation, uh, soil nutrient management, water resource management, uh, and some technologies that we transfer include things from as simple as plastic mulch and trellis twine uh, to hybrid seeds, uh, inorganic fertilizers, uh, crop protection products, and uh, drip irrigation systems. And, and finally, in terms of what they need to succeed, uh, farm administration, or simply uh, record keeping. As important as it is, uh, most smallholder farmers simply don't do it. Uh, it helps them track income and expenses. Uh, it allows them to show financial institutions what their, their past returns are and opportunities are for future returns, uh, which makes them more bankable. And uh, it allows them to make investment decisions to improve the operations uh, of their farm. Um, OK, now here I'd like to provide an overview of the level of support that the project provides. Um, so specifically, as external facilitators, what role does the Cambodia Harvest Project and our local partners play in establishing and supporting these groups? Um, the first is target area selection. Uh, based on several pre-established uh, criteria, including um, horticulture potential, uh, which is inclusive, obviously, of agroecological characteristics, market access, et cetera. Um, and we also consider development impact objectives, uh, inclusive of health and nutrition status of, of villages and other demographics, such as women and youth populations uh, engaged uh, or not engaged in, in agriculture in those areas. Um, we then work uh, through the commune and the village heads to identify farmers that are interested in horticulture group participation. Um, those who are interested and committed uh, self-select into the group. Um, however, within that self-selection process, uh, as facilitators, we very clearly promote uh, these opportunities to women and youth. Uh, and for the leadership of each group, uh, we develop a short list of candidates based on several criteria. Uh, this includes uh, who is respected and trusted in the village, uh, their willingness and ability uh, to transfer the knowledge that they gain to other members uh, and other village members who are not in the groups, of course. Uh, and uh, we consider social inclusion. Uh, so this process of shortlisting leadership candidates allows us as facilitators to for further promote uh, women and, and youth, not only uh, in membership positions, but in leadership positions within the groups. Um, and then the project supports these producer groups for a period of 18 months. 
Uh, and this represents about four to five production cycles. Uh, this is assuming uh, two to three production cycles per year. Um, just as an aside, the number of production cycles depends on uh, their year-round uh, water availability and, and their ability to, to, to harness uh, that water that they do have. Um, so currently, about 45% of all group members now do have access to irrigation and can produce year-round. Um, and the, the specific support that the project uh, provides includes uh, cost shares for uh, inputs uh, initially uh, to jumpstart the lead farmer demonstration sites on which um, knowledge uh, transfer uh, on-farm extension uh, visits take place. Uh, the project also uh, provides access to weekly market-driven on-farm extension visits, uh, as well as, as I mentioned earlier, monthly field days um, between input providers and farmers. And we also um, facilitate initial linkages with key buyers in the area uh, where those relationships uh, do not currently exist. Okay, so uh, after 18 months of uh, initial support, the producer group graduates uh, from project support. And at this point, uh, they're equipped with the knowledge uh, to stand on their own. Um, out of the 73 horticulture producer groups that we've established, um, we found that more than 50 are still operating as a group. Um, it's natural and, and should be expected that not all groups will continue uh, in perpetuity. Um, and, but for those who are not currently operating as groups, those individual farmers now have the technical skills that they need to succeed in the market that they didn't previously have. But for one reason or another, they chose to operate as individual farmers, and that's okay. Um, nonetheless, we, we see that this 70% uh, of groups continuing to operate collectively um, is a testament to the value that, that these types of CSOs can provide in terms of access to on-farm knowledge uh, and, um, and, and market access. Um, some of the factors that, that we believe contribute to the sustained operations of those groups um, are listed here. Uh, Market-driven. Uh, these groups are market-driven and organized around a very discreet shared commercial interest. Um, Self-selection. Um, members choose to join a group or to not join a group. They are not co-opted into this process. Um, the groups are unburdened. Um, they're unburdened by external operational demands, and therefore they have uh, very little to no overhead costs. Um, and they're flexible. Um, as I mentioned before, group dynamics vary from, from group to group, and each one operates a bit differently. Um, some may bulk buy inputs, and some may not. Um, some may organize central collection points for buyers. Some may prefer individual pickups at their farm gate whatever works for them. Um, and some of these seemingly simple collective activities involve a great deal of trust uh, and logistical skills. So while some groups um, um, are collectively organizing their planting decisions based on buyer demands, for instance, they may also prefer to transact as individuals. And, and that's OK. Uh, and that, be, that, may be, uh, that flexibility may be one factor uh, that keeps the majority of these groups operating on their own without project support. And one more thing um, that we think um, contributes to the sustainability of these activities. Um, once farmers experience uh, the tangible value of collective action, they tend to continue it. Um, but if there are problems of free riders or cheating within the group or just limited added value compared to what farmers can achieve as individuals, then the group's ability to be sustained uh, becomes more difficult. Uh, OK, this is my last slide. And it is uh, just a few takeaways that we think are relevant um, in Cambodia and beyond. Um, first, the civil society sector is diverse, as we've, as we've already mentioned. Um, and all forms of CSOs are needed. Um, no single model is a silver bullet uh, for all of the challenges in all of the contexts that we may see. Um, but it's important that we recognize informal producer groups as a part of that robust civil society sector uh, that we're all seeking. Um, next, uh, there's often a lot of uh, focus put on the group or the organization itself. Um, in the case of the informal producer groups, the group itself was not the goal for the project. Uh, the group is seen as an important vehicle for knowledge transfer and market access. 
Um, it's the producer capacity to achieve a critical mass of supply and demand uh, that enables them to increase uh, their incomes that's ultimately the goal. Uh, and a last word on the skills uh, that external facilitators need. Um, in order to gain trust from farmers, uh, to build trust within a producer group, and to foster trust between farmers and market actors, um, we as external facilitators really must bring first and foremost extensive practical, technical, market-driven agronomic knowledge to the table. Um, both farmers and market actors must first trust us uh, and our local partners, of course, in that facilitator role. They need to know that we know what we're talking about, and we can do that by working alongside them to demonstrate success initially. Uh, and of course, we must also have uh, a comprehensive understanding of the local context and the, the ability to ensure um, uh, inclusion and, and gains among uh, women, youth, and other marginalized um, um, individuals within the village. Uh, so that's it for me. Thank you very much. And I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Great. Thank you so much, Adam, for that very thorough presentation. We sincerely appreciate it. Up next, Janice. Janice Ed is a nutrition advisor and public health specialist for USAID with extensive experience of more than 10 years in a variety of capacities. Currently, she is serving as a champion for health, agriculture, and nutrition linkages while coordinating cross-sector activities in Tanzania. In addition, Janeth manages Missions Global Health and Feed the Future activities in improving nutrition status among women and children under five. Prior to joining USAID, she worked with refugee camps, refugees in camps with hands-on programs that addressed severe and acute undernutrition among women and children in those refugee camps. Janeth, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I hope you can hear me. So uh, straight to the point, um, from your side, this standpoint, particularly in relation to nutrition, the agenda of engaging civil society um, is a work uh, in progress. Uh, and this is because the reasons that triggered USAID Tanzania to engage civil society are, uh, are still valid. Um, there is high levels of uh, undernutrition, particularly stunting, of which is a kind of hidden, uh, hidden problem in, uh, from the eyes of, of the community. So um, uh, engagement of civil societies here was very, very important for us. And also, um, I've just seen a lot of programs come and go without leaving a trace. So USAID Tanzania wanted to try make these efforts uh, more sustainable by engaging the community. Um, and uh, if you can recall what uh, uh, Winston has presented, for example, we kind of having uh, an ambitious goals. And so um, in order to achieve that, we needed a broad-based kind of uh, target group to reach where women and children are living. And so civil societies that live in the same community, we thought it was going to be um, important for us. Um, the question of how has not been switched forward, uh, forward even for us, um, um, because, uh, um, for example, we have just learned that uh, um, engaging civil, civil societies uh, in implementation, at the same time building their capacity is not uh, it's not easy, especially if um, a donor or implementing partner is pushing for the uh, quick results. And so uh, to get out of that, um, it's very, very important that during the designing of a program, uh, it's better to build in um, adequate time that will allow the CSO uh, to deliver on the project, but at the same time growing uh, in terms of, uh, of the capacity. And also uh, think about building in um, a transparency that will help the CSOs to understand how to negotiate with the funders, uh, how to effectively implement uh, implemented projects. 
again, uh, you need to build in a good relationship between the implementers and the, um, uh, and, and civil societies. This is because sometimes um, and it can be achieved. This can be achieved by uh, creating environment that attracts uh, trust between the implementing partner and the civil societies. Um, I, I'm just putting this forward because we have had the case in which um, you know civil societies feel like they are left out of the consortium or they are left out. They are not considered to be the same uh, um, partner who can deliver on their mandates. So I think it's very, very important to create the environment of which they can feel comfortable and be able to share what that they feel and to feel to, uh, as, as part of the, of the, of the project. Uh, another important thing is to have a consultative procurement process. So if I can use an example of uh, CS, uh, uh, USID Tanzania, when we are developing these big programs, uh, we had to go out considering different stakeholders in their respective groups, uh, civil societies, uh, private sector, uh, local governments, and so forth. And the question was uh, to ask them, how can they benefit from these projects? We knew it wasn't everybody who was going to be part of the consortium, but we wanted to get the input on what they, they value, on what they think can be helpful for them. And so we got the input and we incorporated those inputs and really uh, they helped us. When we are offering the, uh, uh, issuing the uh, request for proposal for, um, uh, for application, I think that uh, gave courage to CSOs to try and we got a lot of application and you can see the results through the projects that we are implementing right now. So um, uh, from the experience, we now know that uh, uh, effective engagement of civil societies um, have to be accompanied with capacity building. I know uh, one of the presenter has mentioned this, and this capacity, capacity building uh, will, will depend on the need. Um, I could be uh, focusing on things like resource mobilization, financial management, human resource development knowledge management, governance, organizational structure, and so forth. This will be unique to each uh, civil society, and that will come after the assessment is, is done. So if capacity building can be done in a good faith, it can result in a strong productive relationship between CSOs and implementing partners, and they can also uh, build in the confidence uh, that they can, they can do business properly. Over to you. All right, just testing my microphone. It's not, it's, it's on. Ah, there we go. It seems like it may have kicked in. Can you hear me now? Great. Sorry about that. I got a signal from the room that um, I couldn't be heard, but I think the microphone is back now. So I just wanted to say a very strong thank you to our excellent presenters, Winston, Adam, and Janice. We really appreciate your insights on civil society engagement. And thank you also to our attendees who have been posting lots of questions and comments in the chat box. Uh, we will move into a, a Q&A session now for the next 20 minutes or so and uh, ask some of the questions that have come through. And I also just wanted to highlight that the uh, presentation slides are available in the resources box at the left of your screen if you would like to uh, download those and review any portion of the presentation. And of course, we are also recording this presentation, and we'll send you, as an attendee, uh, the link to the recording in about a week's time or so, um, maybe a bit later. And uh, that way, you can share it with your networks or review anything that you missed. All right, so we have a lot of questions come through. We'll see how many we can get through. Um, I'll pose them either to Winston or Adam or both. Um, also. Happy to have Susan jump in and Janice, um, and um, and we'll so do feel free to jump in if you have any comments uh, on these questions. 
So to start off, I think um, a question that came up a couple of times in the chat box and often comes up at our Ag Sector Councils, um, which is just the specific angles towards engaging youth and engaging women and how that fits into your presentations and into this discussion. So um, both Winston and Adam or Janice, um, if you wouldn't mind commenting on any specifics of how things are different when engaging the youth population or engaging women. Hi, I, Julie, I can um, just jump in very quickly and uh, give a perspective um, from, from Cambodia Harvest. Um, so the question was specifically um, how we engage them and, and if there were any additional challenges, is that correct? Yes, if, it, if that poses any different challenges for civil society engagement. Um, well, so in for Cambodia Harvest, um, in commercial horticulture specifically, um, the, the commercial horticulture farmers that we're working with are approximately 45% uh, women. Um, and in Cambodia, generally, you really, you really can't be working in agriculture and not work with women. They're, they're very engaged at multiple stages of the value chain. Um, and it's really a matter of um, ensuring their participation uh, up front. Um, so when we are, are introducing activities at the commune level, uh, we make it very clear, and if we have introductory meetings, um, we encourage uh, the participation of women uh, as, as well as youth in the, in the area. Um, sometimes um, organizing the timing of those meetings is a critical factor, um, given all of the other tasks uh, that women in a village, uh, in, a, in an agrarian village, are, are burdened with. Um, so we make sure we organize those, those meetings uh, to raise awareness of what's taking place at times that are appropriate for women. And we do the same things for um, the, the knowledge transfer activities to make sure women are, are active. Great. Uh, Winston, do you have any comments on engaging youth or women? Not really. Maybe I can comment on the engagement of women, and I can add on to what Adam has just said, especially when it comes to engaging women. In our program, for instance, talking from the experience that we have, the services that we give to the community is through the peer support group that are usually composed of women and men. And, and one of the special features for engaging women is by making sure that when women are engaged, there are several factors, including Adam what has just said in terms of the timing, because like a lot of other women in the world, women in Tanzania, especially in the rural community, are usually the everything in terms of the family work, family relation, even being the main bread earner. So when you engage with him and you have to really to make sure the context in which this woman lived and if they are meeting to discuss at what is time is appropriate for them without even compromising with other equally relevant roles within the family. And very specifically for our program, for instance, it is a nutrition program. So one of the things that he are really being promoted is to reduce their workload, including the interaction time. So sometimes it's a contradiction because what we preach and what we are encouraging them to do. And in right, cases, great. Thank you for those comments. Um, Winston, I have a couple more <laughs> questions that came in early on during your presentation that I thought I would pose to you. Uh, two questions. One is from and Vicki Marone will... um, from Michigan State University, who asks, can you share the process of the... the especially the oh. married one. The yeah. side of the... Okay. She can...
All right, Winston, can you, you can hear me now. Please confirm. I think we just had a bit of a delay um, with Winston's audio feed. So perhaps I will jump to a couple of questions um, that came in during Adam's presentation um, while we wait for Winston's audio feed to catch up. Can say go, I did get it. Oh. Um, so I think I will jump over to Adam just to make sure that Winston's feed is, is coming through strongly. Um, but Adam, we had a lot of clarifying questions come in about Cambodia harvest. And so I thought I would just rattle a couple of them off. Um, and one of them was, how did you measure the incremental sales when we know that we didn't start with all of the beneficiaries from the outset in order to have a good baseline? Uh, well, we, sorry, the, the question being how do we measure incremental sales? Yes. Uh, we, we measure incremental sales compared to a baseline. So we, we do conduct a, a, a comprehensive baseline um, up front. Um, normally this happens within six months of project startup. Um, and then we conduct um, statistically significant um, samples uh, of, um, of the beneficiaries of the clients uh, that the project works with. And, um, and this can be extrapolated to the, to the population level of the project. OK, great. And um, Vicki Marone asks, to serve the 800 plus farmers that you mentioned, about how many technical personnel are part of your work? Uh, yeah. Um, that's a that's a great question. I actually don't know specifically how many uh, field extension officers we have dedicated to the horticulture co uh, producer groups. Um, we we do have uh, both um, uh, agronomists on staff that that visit uh, groups and all beneficiaries uh, once a week, uh, and we also have local partners. Uh, local NGOs uh, that um, that have agronomists on staff. Um, so we we do this through both uh, both of those uh, channels. Uh, and and there in other cases um, we also work through uh, where incentives are aligned uh, for embedded extension mechanisms. So um, we have several partnerships with input providers, as I mentioned, monthly field days. Uh, in those cases, they may deliver uh, training on how their products work. For instance, a drip irrigation provider will deliver training on installing or, 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 or maintaining uh, the system over time. So if you contact me offline, I can get you the specific number of, um, of staff that we have um, dedicated to the horticulture side of things. I don't have that number in front of me. OK, great. And um, lastly for the moment, a question from Richard Tinsley. He was wondering if you could give a estimate of the advantage of bulking inputs and market produce. Um, what are the overhead costs being incurred by the group to get the bulking advantage? Or is there any quantitative information you can share? Uh, I, I don't have specifically um, the reduction in unit cost um, data, um, and I don't know if we if we collect that for harvest. Um, in terms of the overhead cost, there are there are no overhead costs um, to for for that particular function of the group to take place, other than um, transportation to the input provider. Um, which are quite close. Um, if you know Cambodia, most uh, either at the village level or the commune level, there will be a rural input uh, dealer. Uh, and we are also working, um, we are working to support input dealers, both in terms of training them on inventory management, um, as, as well as you know, delivering that information to farmers that they need to. Um, so 
in the areas where we're working, the input suppliers are very well stocked. And they began investing in stocking their inventory when they saw the increased demand uh, from the project farmers. Um, and of course, the project farmers' demand increased when they saw the returns that they could uh, generate from, uh, from these improved practices. Great, thank you. All right, we discovered that we had a bit of a delay just with Winston's audio, maybe about 10 seconds. So I'm going to go ahead and ask him a question and then um, pause to make sure he has plenty of time to answer. And so a question, Winston, that came in during your presentation from Gretchen Thompson, a scientist with Family Health International in Durham, North Carolina. How is long-term success in civil society engagement being measured? Also, are the social and behavior change communication, or SBCC, initiatives coupled with any other programmatic interventions, such as economic strengthening? Um, yes, I think I'll, I will give that to Janet, and then I'll add on. Or uh, if Nene also can answer from Washington, that would be great. But I think we start with Janet first. Great. Janet, please feel free to chime in. I don't hear you yet, Janice, if you're speaking. Yeah, I, I was saying um, I, I would just like to start with the uh, second portion of the question where he's asking about um, if, we, if the SBCC is being coupled with the other uh, interventions. Yes, um, and this nutrition program is uh, hosted within the economic growth section of which uh, is mainly dealing with um, uh, feed the future uh, investments. And so it's about agriculture, the value chains that we are dealing with. And so even the nutrition is part of that. So on top of the ACBCC that we are doing right now, we have uh, other interventions that are targeting on that diversification. Uh, First of all, that has to come from the main value chains that we the future is, is, is working on. But also, uh, we have uh, small, small components of home gardening and uh, raising uh, livestock just for the purpose of making sure that the uh, uh, target group that we are focusing on, women and children, are getting diversified food. Um, maybe I will leave the other question. The, the, second portion to um, Winston to respond. Yes, unless Nene, Nene, do you have anything to add on in the long term measure for the sustainability of the future? I, I would say that the Sorry, I'll work getting the audio um, for Nene here in the DC room to um, to come through. Or here, why don't I? Okay, I was saying that uh, on this project we have not started uh, uh, measuring long-term sustainability. We are like on the fourth year of the project, but uh, it's a concern long-term sustainability uh, for CSOs. Uh, I would say that uh, uh, it's critical for CSOs to be linked to government, you know, in terms of uh, uh, supervision, monitoring, and uh, working together throughout the project, which we are doing already, uh, to ensure that at the end of the project, when there is no more funding, that uh, the government can step in and continue to work with these uh, CSOs that we have built uh, the capacity to implement. All right. Thank you both. Um, so 
looking at a few of the other questions that came through, um, I thought this was an interesting one. Um, how to, to discuss a little bit more the importance of the local context. You both stressed that. Um, but a bit more of the how does one gain a comprehensive understanding of the local context in um, your project location. It's undoubtedly complex in many situations with limited time or monetary resources. So any comments on that? Yeah, if I may comment on that, I think it is true. It speaks to itself in the sense that the different CSCOs in different capacities, depending whether they are national based or local based, do react and grow and fluster differently depending on the context in which they are operating. And even in cases where, for instance, in our case, we refer to and we insist on making sure that the CSO work hand in hand with the government, which is usually the mandated institution to provide the service which CSO is really providing us and helping or support the government to, to, to provide. In such cases also, the context within which that CSO do differ in the meaning that uh, even if we say this CCO is working, for instance, at region level or at district level, it will depend on the type of the administration at that region and that district, and one. But then second, it will depend on the nature of the community which it is serving, whether it is, for instance, a pastoralist-based or agriculture-based or pastoralist agriculture-based or depending on and whether it is urban or semi-urban or pure rural aspect and the nature of the economic activity that is being engaged in. So there are lots of factors. You cannot really draw a line and say this is what will apply to where. Over to you. Yeah, I, I would like to... I'm using her. Yeah, I, I wanted to add that uh, what works for us in general is uh, recruiting local staff that are familiar with the culture and the context. It's really helpful, you know, 95, 97, and I would say of African staff is, uh, you know, from Africa, which is uh, very helpful in, 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 in a, a rapid startup of project. They know the context, they don't need much orientation about, you know, what the community is, you know, how they think, what, why they do what they do. That, uh, to us, is extremely helpful in, in, in uh, uh, starting quickly and implementing, you know, based on what, you know, the, the staff know already about the people we are serving. All right. Um, we had a question come in from our uh, event page online, uh, so not here in this chat box, but from our event page uh, that I think would be interesting to pose. And um, uh, an attendee asks, in parts of West Africa, which are emerging from long democratic transitions, the private sector and professional associations have not emerged as a set of interest groups to inform policy and, and resource priorities by advancing the interest of their constituencies. Policy centers, media, academia are not meeting the needs for research analysis, awareness building, in part because there's not a big demand or market for such services from government um, or, or civil society interest groups or the general public. So how do implementing partners and donors support, support civil society to make this transition? Is that a question that anyone can jump in on? 
Um, Julie, if the if the question is um, specific to to West Africa, um, I, I wouldn't be appropriate to answer that. But just you know, generally um, in in Cambodia, I would refer back um, to some of those enabling environment characteristics uh, that we talked about. Um, and, and just a general comment on Cambodian civil society and their role in, in policy advocacy. Um, it, it, is, it is an extremely contentious and challenging situation in Cambodia for um, civil society and local interest groups um, to influence um, the, the ruling party decisions um, where, um, where it conflicts with their own interests. Um, and so in many ways, it really is about aligning the interests of communities uh, with, with the private sector and the, and the public sector development objectives. And that is, that is a great deal of what we do in Cambodia through the technical working groups, which are uh, multi-stakeholder platforms uh, to discuss some of these issues. But in terms of um, political advocacy, um, it, that is not specifically something that the Cambodia Harvest Project um, engages in. Thank you. If I may, I may add in. That's a good insight, even though. Oh, Please. Hello. Yeah, if I may add in, in uh, around that question in Tanzania, and specifically with the nature of the CSO that we deal with, actually the type of the civil society organization that we deal with can be termed as still very far in terms of journey towards doing exactly that, because the civil society that we engage and partner with are actually themselves engage in service provision. So uh, for in order for a CSO to really qualify to be a very strong watchdog or advocating for a police, it has to be a civil society that does not engage itself in the service delivery to be able to stand aside and look and criticize what is going on. And that's not the case in our civil society that the category that we are really engaged in in our program. And maybe Janet can add that. Um, yeah, if I may add on that. Hello? I'm, 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 I'm. In nutrition programming, for example. But so far, they, they don't have the skills to do uh, advocacy. Uh, Janet, I think you wanted to leap in as well? Yeah, uh, I wanted to emphasize one of the points here uh, um, Winston was trying to, ma uh, to make. Uh, in relation on the uh, how uh, the, the strength of the CSOs and and you know the the technical capacity of the CSOs the one that leads uh, to engage them in whatever I don't know field that they are capable of and so prior I was try, trying to explain on how it is difficult to engage uh, a certain CSO in activity implementation at the same time trying to build the capacity. All we have seen is that sometimes there is a mismatch. You push them too hard to get results, uh, but uh, um, you know you get delay on on the capacity building. So in that case, uh, it becomes uh, very very difficult to just find uh, CSOs that is uh, really focused and can do the advocacy nicely as you would want to see. Um, uh, unless you, you, you just set aside sometimes to make sure that you go slowly building capacity uh, and at the same time trying to engage those issues in activities. I'm going to wrap up unless anyone has any further comments. 
All right. Thank you so much to all of our presenters for your comments. We're going to wrap up as we're at the end of our uh, webinar time slot here. Um, I'd, I'd really like to extend a, a huge thank you to our presenters and apologize for a few audio issues along the way um, that sometimes can happen when we are bringing in speakers from around the world, which is uh, something we're always trying to do and um, you know, trying to make sure that we bring perspectives from the field uh, to our AgroLinks audience. But I think it was a, a rich discussion, and we know that there are a few questions that weren't able to be answered, but you're welcome to continue the conversation on the AgroLinks event page for this uh, seminar, which has been posted a couple of times in the chat box. And we'll also share all of the remaining questions um, with the presenters. And I know there was also a lot of interest in Cambodia Harvest and the details of that program. So we'll try and get some uh, specific information about Harvest up on AgriLinks, um, perhaps on the blog, to make sure you have the information you need. All right, so you can see that there are some poll questions on the screen right now. Um, please take them a moment before you depart to answer these polls. They help us improve our events for the future. And we always like to know a little bit more about our audience and about um, whether this event was useful to you. We're always open to your feedback, and we really appreciate it. So thank you so much to uh, Susan, to Winston, to Adam, uh, Janice, and Nene, and all of the support staff who have helped make this webinar happen today. And we'll be sending you information soon about uh, future events. So thank you very much for joining. And we'll talk to you next time.